We're going to be using Taylor series quite a bit in the methods that come up, so it's a good idea to review them if you're not already feeling very comfortable with them. Um, we won't get into all the technical details that you may have learned the first or second time you learned them. Um, we just won't need quite all the uh, heavy-duty machinery. So if we have a function that has infinitely many derivatives at a particular point A, then the Taylor series is a power series of this form where f of x is a sum of terms of degree 0, degree 1, degree 2, and so on. Now this expression as a power series in x is valid only for certain values of x. Um, those values of x whose absolute value, um, whose distance from a, absolute value of x minus a, is less than some number r, which is known as the radius of convergence. And r is any number, could even be 0, in which case the series doesn't converge at all. Or it could be infinity, in which case the series converges everywhere. And you may have learned this all about uh, real numbers x. You probably did. But the same thing is true of complex numbers as well. So even if x is a complex number, uh, we have this kind of a condition, in which case uh, the, the term radius convergence makes even more sense because it's the radius of a circle centered at the point A. Okay, uh, Just an equivalent form to the writing the Taylor series this way, if we change variables so that x is equal to a plus delta, so it's just thinking in terms of perturbations to the point A as opposed to just an arbitrary value of x, but with that substitution it's completely equivalent to the original, and we can write it in this form instead as increasing powers of this delta. All right, so you can always churn out a series um, knowing the formula for f of x, but there uh, are a number of cases where we use functions where the, the series come up over and over and over again, and so it's best just to know them so you don't have to derive them or look them up every single time. Um, maybe the most useful to us is going to be this first one. That this is called the geometric series. The odds are pretty good that it's the first one you ever learned about. And it just says that 1 over 1 plus x is the sum of 1 plus x plus x squared and so on. And that's valid only uh, for cases where the absolute value of x is less than 1. We also have this series of the exponential function uh, for which all the derivatives are equal to 1. And the sines and the cosines which take the even and odd numbered terms, or I'm sorry, the odd and even numbered terms respectively um, with alternating signs. Then starting from these series, you can often um, derive a series without going through the, the whole derivative process um, simply by substituting and doing series arithmetic. So for the most part, series objects behave like you would expect them to behave. Um, of course, proving that it all works using hardcore mathematics is a lot harder, um, but we can, we're just going to kind of take these manipulations for granted. So for example, if I wanted to find the series expansion of 1 over 1 plus x squared at a equals 0, Okay, that's sort of implied here. Well, that looks like a geometric series. If we rewrite it this way, right, we can look at this as 1 over 1 minus z, where z is equal to negative x squared. And therefore, we can use a geometric series expression. So what happens when we substitute back in for z? Uh, z squared is equal to x to the fourth. z cubed is equal to minus x to the sixth. Um, oh gee, I made a goof here. Sorry about that. It's 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed. 
So that's 1 minus x squared. Okay, z squared is x to the fourth. z cubed is minus x to the sixth. z to the fourth would be plus x to the eighth, and so on. And that's valid for absolute value of z less than 1, which is the same thing as absolute value of x less than 1. Okay, here's a more complicated example. Now we have 1 over a series, okay? But in fact, we can still look at this as though it's 1 over 1 minus z if we define z as all that infinite stuff. And you do have to remember that you factored out a minus sign from everything. Oops. Okay, so we have 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed, and so on. Okay, so the first term is pretty easy. And it's always helpful to write down the order of the first term you've admitted, omitted, uh, because sometimes it, it happens that you have to come back later and, and look for those terms. Okay, the next one I have um, x squared over 2 times itself. So I guess it helps to imagine that what we've got here really is each term, okay, appearing in both terms of the products. So that means I have x to the fourth over 4. That's the x squared over 2 times x squared over 2. And then I have x squared over 2 times negative x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And then I have another negative x to the fourth over 4 factorial times x squared over 2. So I get minus 2 of those times x to the sixth Okay, over 2 times 4 factorial. Uh, 4 factorial is 24. So this is 48. All right. Now, what's next? Well, I have to multiply x to the fourth by x to the fourth. So the next term would actually be order x to the eighth. Okay, plus, now this was originally z cubed. z starts with the power of x squared. So this term that I've left out is x to the sixth. So if we are happy to stop at the uh, fourth order term, we have 1 plus x squared over 2. Um, and then the um, minus, so on the fourth power, right? we have this fourth power here, this fourth power here. So that's minus 1 over 24 plus 6 over 24. So that gives us plus 5 over 24 x to the fourth. And then the next term omitted is x to the sixth. OK, so very mechanical, um, but also quite lengthy. So one more thing about the Taylor series, um, and one of the ways that we're going to use it, is that if we decide to stop early and not take the whole series, what we get is a polynomial, right? So the most famous case is if we stop at the n equals 1 term, uh, we get the linearization of the function. And 
if we were to go out one more term, we'd get a quadratic approximation. And for small values of delta, in other words, if we stay close to the point A, for small values of delta, delta cubed should be a lot smaller than delta squared, and so we should be making less error um, when we get close to the point by keeping three terms instead of just two.